This video was made possible by the Laurel Foundation, Bay Area Lime Foundation, and the Limelight Foundation. Stephen Harris, and I'm a medical doctor. I went to undergrad at UCLA, went on to Howard University for medical school, and then completed a family practice residency, University of Illinois in Chicago. So a tick bite happens. A tick is on an animal. An animal is carrying these various ticks. Some of these animals already have the infection in them from previous tick bites. A new tick comes on the animal, attaches the infection from that animal, enters into the midgut of the tick. The tick then falls off the animal and looks for a new host. The tick attaches to that host, in this case people, and within a very short time, latches on and begins feeding on us. In that midgut of the tick are the spirochetes, and it gets pushed back into the wound. It's almost like the tick vomits the spirochetes back into the wound. Very quickly, those organisms can disseminate in the body. We know, and there's been quite a bit of research, that within 15 to 20 minutes, these spirochetes can disseminate outside of that initial wound. We also know that the spirochetes travel better through tissue than they even do through the bloodstream. So they can move from one organ to another and through into the nervous system quite rapidly. So the best way to minimize transmission is by carefully with a forceps, it can be blunt or sharp, but with the forceps and grabbing right at the front part of the thorax and you take upward, very slow, but firm and constantly firm pressure to ease the tick out. The head will often pop out, attach to the body, and the tick should probably be saved so it can be tested. But the best way to do it is by not destroying the tick, not stressing the tick out. Many of these ticks aren't even gonna actually transmit those infections, especially if they've been removed properly, if they've been removed quickly. One should watch for a rash. There's various kinds of rashes. Some ticks, it seems, on the East Coast are more apt to create a so-called bullseye rash, which is a fairly round rash that's red, often clear in the center that expands occasionally and gets bigger. However, in many other parts of the world, we don't actually see this rash. So you can't just watch for a rash as a way to guide you if you have these infections. It's quite important to understand the quantity or prevalence of various infections and make decisions often with the patient about choosing to treat prophylactically before you actually get sick. Other times what you can do is you can wait and see if someone develops symptoms. Now, that's not always a very good idea because there are many patients who do get Lyme disease, but they don't actually get sick right away. Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis, which means that if you get bit by a tick and you become sick afterwards in a way that's consistent with Lyme and you respond to treatment, you probably have Lyme even if you, one, don't do a test, or two, test negative. The tests are improving as we go, but they're not perfect. A Western blot looks at your immune response to very particular pieces of the infection. So the way that your system recognizes that infection, it's almost like it makes mirror images. There's dozens of tests we can do. Some look at, at the infection, some look at the immune response. None of them are perfect. They all have limitations. We would love that perfect test, but so far there is no perfect test. Lyme disease, again, is, is everywhere. So thinking of flu-like illness after a trip out in the woods is quite important to think about. Looking for ticks on your pets, thinking about travel. The l most common symptoms that happen often three to 30 days after a bite are flu-like symptoms, neck pain or stiffness, migrating muscle aches, and occasionally joint pain that initially centers in large joints. The hard part from a practitioner's point of view is to not overdiagnose it as well. So I do know that there are just bugs that people get. People get viruses. And so I don't want to see Lyme 
everywhere if it's not there. But when you put together the risk factors and you put together the time and you put together the physical exam and then you add the tests into it to give support to a clinical picture that's unfolding, then it becomes a bit more scientific. So it really takes a high index of suspicion and really paying attention and not dismissing flu-like symptoms outright, especially in the summertime. If Lyme disease is diagnosed early, within three weeks or so of the bite, then it's remarkably treatable. There is some debate about this. Is it, as some studies say, one or two doses of an antibiotic, or is it four to six weeks, as another group of scientists and clinicians think. But if the proper treatment is given, the disease can usually go away and not come back. Early disseminated Lyme also is a simplistic term because it suggests that Lyme may stay in one place when it's early localized because the immune system is able to, to bridge it off from the rest of the body. When we know that that's not true, that most often, most early Lyme becomes very rapidly disseminated, disseminates to the lymph nodes and then onto the nervous system. The concept of early disseminated suggests, however, that it is in the body in many more places than where it started, and that perhaps in order to eradicate it in all of its places, that it needs a stronger course of treatment to get to all the places where it is. A very common situation that we find throughout the country with early disseminated Lyme, that someone is quite sick rapidly where they have cardiac symptoms, they have neurologic symptoms, they have lots of lymph nodes everywhere, they have liver enzyme elevation, they have kidney issues, they have bladder pain, they have musculoskeletal pain. The treatment is still, according to some societies, very short course, that it's still 15 to 30 days. I disagree with that. I feel that each person is different and that the dissemination could go deeper in some people, can hide in some people, even if it's early. So not only am I gonna be looking for co-infections, Babesia ehrlichia, Anaplasma, and Bartonella, but I'm going to treat patients until the symptoms are gone. Even if that takes longer than that initial 15 to 30 days that some other medical societies agree with. The concept of chronic Lyme disease, or late stage Lyme disease, as it's more appropriately called, is a very, very difficult disease entity. These are the folks where we talk about Lyme disease, we think of this multiple systemic infectious disease syndrome, where there's co-infections, there's the immune system, which becomes very inflamed, both overzealous and inefficient. So it starts creating allergies and hyperimmune responses in the body, and we get hormonal imbalances, we get liver issues, we get problems with so-called detoxification, we get gluten sensitivities and other kind of food sensitivities. And this is really where the integrative medicine folks and the naturopathic physicians have had to step in because even long courses of treatment with pure pharmaceutical antibiotics haven't been able to eradicate these infections all the time in this patient population. Antibiotics are the mainstay of treatment for many patients. We have had patients who have used antibiotics for very extended periods of time, and every time they try to get off the antibiotics, their symptoms relapse. So it begs the question, are these antibiotics working to the extent that we expect them to? Or are they just creating a stalemate? And I feel that this is the case for many patients. Antibiotics themselves are also fraught with problems. They cause oftentimes gastrointestinal distress, liver issues, bone marrow issues, every kind of issue we could see under the sun. There's herbs that are both antimicrobial that also kill organisms. There's herbs and other forms of treatment that enhance the immune system's own ability to fight the infection, so-called detoxing the liver, detoxing the kidneys, detoxing the lymphatics, detoxing the skin. There's modalities such as saunas and all sorts of machines that can help the body become more aligned. There's all sorts of psychological methods 
to bring the mind-body state together to enhance healing. And so if we could calm the body, decrease the pain, help the body become stronger via diet, via exercise, via meditation, that their immune system will truly improve. Lifestyle is important, but if you have an active Lyme disease infection, lifestyle by itself is not going to eradicate that infection. It's not going to get somebody back to baseline, not even close. It's going to help. And if that means taking the supplements, having better food, making those choices to exercise every day despite the pain. That is going to get somebody better long term. So chronic fatigue is the most common symptom in Lyme disease. Not all patients who have chronic fatigue have Lyme disease. Most patients who have Lyme disease have chronic fatigue. This could be from the disease, the other corollary diseases, such as some of the viruses that people get when they have the disease because their immune system isn't working as well. This could have to do with the hormonal issues, with some of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal issues, which are also hormone issues, but at a brain level. This could have to do with the overall level of inflammation. Pain can cause a chronic fatigue. The way to, to deal with this is to try to work on as many possible system as you, you humanly can. That means, are there potential exposures that are contributing to the inflammation? Is someone in a moldy or otherwise toxic environment? All right, let's change that environment. Is there anything that's coming into their body, such as smoke or diet or alcohol, that's also contributing to this inflammation and their body's inability to be efficient? So trying to help the body being as efficient as possible via the environment and everything that goes into their body. For joint and muscle pain, one needs to stop what's driving that pain, which is often the infections, but it's also a hyperinflammatory response. So you need to calm the system down. You do need to either kill the bugs or get the immune system not caring about the bugs so much. So you need to help the immune system not be so over aggressive because of underperformance. And I feel that that's probably what's happening with a lot of pain. The immune system isn't able to efficiently attack the infections. And as a result, it becomes overzealous to the things that are normal in the body. Helping normalize the immune system by helping offload some of the extra waste that's in the body and the acid in the body that's helping to contribute to this. All this can help decrease pain to some degree. The brain fog is to the point of causing full depersonalization in people. Brain fog, oftentimes we think of ammonia. We think of the yeast overload, we think of the bacteria, we think of the gut bacteria, we think of other toxic aspects that are happening to create this ammonia, and you try to offload the ammonia to help with brain fog. Sometimes you can use L-ornithine, you can use all these other things that help decrease ammonia, and if you can get them to the right places in high enough quantities, then a lot of times the brain fog can go away. Neuropathy means that there's either pain or lack of sensation in some of the various peripheral nerves, the distal nerves. This could be coming from the brain, that perhaps the wrong signals from the brain are being sent to the distal nerves. So is this a brain problem? If so, it needs to be worked on in the brain. If the neuropathy is from an over-inflammatory process, then inflammation needs to be decreased and the system that's driving that inflammation needs to be decreased or eliminated. It's oftentimes Bartonella when there's Lyme can cause neuropathy, heavy metals can cause neuropathy, tons of other environmental organophosphates can cause neuropathy. So there's a contributory effect, all which adds together, causing the final result of the neuropathy. Thankfully, there's a lot of new stem cell research, and if it's inflammatory or degenerative, the stem cells could be pretty awesome. Patients have to become self-aware. They need to realize that much of this is the disease process itself, and to be able to piece out what likely is the disease and what are the effects of either meds or the stress or having been told by doctors that I don't have an illness or by having my loved ones leave me or not understand or me not be able to participate in their lives to see how much of this disease is related to physical disease versus what's happened because of the physical disease. Now, it's a really difficult thing to do, and it's not anything that one person can often do by themselves. And a lot of times they don't trust the providers and others to even guide them in this. And a lot of times we don't know ourselves what part is what part, but 
we do know that there's a physical component to this. Part of helping patients manage their expectations is developing a relationship with them, being honest with them. When the provider doesn't know, you have to be honest that you don't know. And there's a lot of times that we don't know. Oftentimes we do know what the next likely steps are. And so often if we can guide patients within a short time frame about what likely is going to be the outcome of this various treatment or this various symptom and how it's going to resolve, what we usually tell patients who come in and who've been sick for a very long time is that there's going to be oftentimes in the beginning of treatment a much worsening and then we walk, walk them through some of the worsening. Then the next stage is oftentimes that perhaps there's a day where the bad part of the day isn't quite so bad and the good part of the day is better than usual. And then they have a day where they don't have many symptoms at all. And then they have a few days a month where they don't have symptoms. So a lot of times when you can talk about after having seen it, the quality of symptoms that they're gonna have, the length of time that these symptoms are gonna last, we won't know that until we start seeing treatment. It's a downward spiral for a lot of people. It's very tough. Treating kids with Lyme has its own particular set of challenges. On the flip side, most kids improve remarkably. Most of them recover who have Lyme disease, and it's wonderful to see. However, the process can still be quite long, and there can still be relapses, and there can still be flare-ups. It's still quite difficult. Knowing that, yes, they feel sick. Yes, they can't read as fast and write as fast sometimes, that there are days that they need to take breaks. And letting them become more aware, showing them how to become more aware of their body and when they need to rest, to have them become better self-monitors of their own behavior and their own feelings is one of the best ways to work with them as you go. And so as a society, what we need to do, and it seems that we're moving in that direction, is understanding chronic illness a bit more holistically. There are so many incredible providers, so many amazing doctors and naturopathic physicians and other forms of practitioners out there who are starting to work together like never before as a team because with a group of people who all are dedicated to treating Lyme disease through their own personal insight and their own knowledge base, using science and using other systems of health and healthcare and understanding of the world. Working together in a group is the way that the sickest group of patients are gonna recover their health. And it's really quite exciting.